Okay, today this is kind of a personal story. I'd like to talk to you about a conversation I had with a very close relative of mine that after her husband of almost 73 years died, I was talking to her one day on the phone and she made the statement, we really don't know what happens when a person dies. And I'm thinking, I believe we do. And so I didn't want to really get too much into the Bible because I've never discussed the Bible with her. The lady was a Christian. She'd gone to church all of her adult life. And yet she wasn't really sure status of her husband. And so I began to talk to her a little bit and I just covered a few scriptures from memory and discussed them with her. And she said, can you send me a list of those? By all means. <laughs> That was the opportunity of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, now this person I'm talking about is 92 and a half years old. She expressed this desire to want to know, where is my husband? What is, what's happening to him? Now, she had been going, like I said, to this church all her adult life, Protestant church. So I sent, sent these verses to her. Called her back a couple of weeks later to make sure that she got the verses. And she would read them by then. And she said, well, that's exactly what the Bible says. <laughs> Why don't we do that? <laughs> That's exactly right. Why don't we do that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Okay, so he, we're saying they're sleeping. So what does this mean? So, so that you will not grieve as those, the rest, the rest of the people who have no hope because they don't have any firm foundation of really what they believe. And so they have really no hope at all. It's just like this person is gone. They lived and they died. That's it. It says, but if we believe, if that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, amplify has God will also bring with him through Jesus, which is, I think, expresses the thought better. Those who have fallen asleep in Jesus or they died in Jesus. They were Christians. Well, this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So this is not some of Paul's ideas. Sometimes he will express himself, his opinion. In this case, he said, this is by the word of the Lord. So you, it, you need to listen. For we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede or go ahead of those who have fallen asleep in death. 416. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this is where a lot of people get the idea of rapture. And in a sense, it is a rapture, but it's not a pre-tribulation thing where seven years early or three and a half years early, depending on which system you believe in. This is when Christ returns to resurrect the dead. This is all one event. And then it says, then we, now that could be we, or it could have been them. It could be another group hundred years from now. Ever who's alive at that time, this verse does not just apply to Paul. Some people use this as a proof text to say that we, meaning that it occurred in that particular 70 years is what they say. We who are alive, because some of us have to be alive, so this should happen. That we, the is actually that the period of time to say the 500s, the 1000s, the 1500s, etc., etc., or that future time. We who are alive, the, the group of people, Christians who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them to meet the clouds, to meet them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. That doesn't mean we're going to be in the air forever, because another verse states, his feet will touch down the Mount of Olives. And therefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? The words we just read. That there is hope. There's a resurrection coming for the just and the unjust. Everybody will be resurrected. This lesson affects every human being that's ever walked the planet Earth. You may not believe it, but it's going to happen. It's going to affect everyone in this room. Everyone that's listening, it will affect you. So what does the Bible mean when it says the fallen asleep are dead in Christ? Now, this is, I realize I'm kind of preaching to the choir today. This is some real basic material. But you'd be surprised how many people don't understand this. And we just take this granted, this precious truth for granted because we're so accustomed to it. But when you go to a funeral, you realize how blessed you are that God has allowed you to understand this. So what does it mean to be asleep or dead in Christ? Let's go to John 11, 1. Okay, Lazarus is dead. So you can see how sleep and death interchangeable in the Bible. When you're dead, it's like being asleep. Uh -huh. Then he had said to them, our friend has fallen asleep. <clears throat> in other words, he's dead. But I go that I can wake him up. Now get this. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will come. You know, sleep is supposed to be very good when you're sick. It helps your body 
healed. Now, Jesus had told, spoken of his death, but they thought, so don't feel bad if you don't understand the Bible sometimes, but they thought he was speaking of literal death. See, his disciples, taught personally by Jesus, still misunderstood some stuff. So why should we feel bad when we <laughs> misunderstand things? So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, that's like hitting them with a sledgehammer, I'm sure, because they had this idea that that wasn't going to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we see even Christ follows the same pattern. He had fallen asleep, but yet he was dead, yet he was raised. And by, of course, we know by his resurrection, we're guaranteed a resurrection from the dead if we continue. By if you continue, remember another place, Christ said, truly you are my disciples, if you continue my words. So we're not saved, once saved situation. It's a conditional thing. You can't just go out here and get saved one time and go live like the devil the rest of the time. And, okay, other verses that compare uh, death to being asleep is like Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. Will awake. There'll be resurrection. These to everlasting life, but to others, disgrace and everlasting contempt. So we have eternal life on one hand, or life in the age to come, or eternal death on the other hand. Psalm 13, 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. Yeah. So you can see they're compared all the time that when we talk about someone asleep in Christ or dead in Christ, they're synonymous. We're really saying the same thing, just in different phrases or terms. Okay, does a dead person have any knowledge of anything going on? When they're lying in the grave, in the dust of the earth, is their soul or some kind of spirit or ghost somewhere looking down on their children, their, their family? Let's see. Let's turn to uh, Ecclesiastes. Okay, if you want to read Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and verse 10. I think the Bible answers, it answers the question about what happened. So at least their thoughts perish. We have to agree we have plenty of scripture to indicate that a dead person does not know anything. And I looked up the word mortal just to make sure. So mortal means to be subject to dying, to die, to be dead. So I think that should be basically an easy thing to understand if you can just believe what the, what the basic words mean there. What was the hope of the Apostle Paul? And what should our hope be? Did Paul hope to die and go to heaven? Or did he have a other, another hope? Acts chapter 23, verse 6 and verse 7. Two religious groups here kind of debating each other. And one believed in the resurrection and one group didn't. So when, when will this actually this resurrection take place? Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is the best resurrection chapter within the scripture. It even talks about when Christ will deliver the kingdom up to the Father. So you've got the whole deal from the time he comes on the scene and he's resurrected. There's a, you know, the first fruit. Then those that are his at his coming. Um, so all that is in chapter 15. And that's where you need to know. Go to read that to get all the details. This is just touching on it lightly. Okay. John 6, 39 says, When will the resurrection of the Christians of Christians occur or take place? The last day of this age, eternal life. And, you know, we've been taught that this is ages to come. That it's not just eternal. You know, that word sometimes is translated everlasting or eternal. And you can see how these ages are used in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. So you can see how the word age is used right within the scriptures. You don't have to go to an outside source. And by the way, when I was talking about earlier about sending these scriptures to uh, this person, it's a good idea to stick with their translation. What you're going to run into, because I taught some of this stuff publicly for a while, most people are hung up on the King James Version. So you've got to use King James Version. Speak. <laughs> Talk. I think. You've got to show them their own scripture. To, if you start reading from another translation, like the Living Translation, New American Standard Bible, whatever it may be, they're saying, oh, you've got one of those modern Bibles, and yeah, this was good enough for the Apostle Paul. <laughs> they say, it was good enough for me. <laughs> so you have to kind of combat that. It, it took me about, I don't know, two or three years, several years to convince a person that there were really better translations to read than the King James. Ask yourself, when's the last time you read a book written in 1600? How many novels do you read? Do you see what I'm saying? The language is foreign to us. It's very removed from us. 
Yeah, some of the words we can see, but some we guess at. And then you got to spend half your time with a dictionary looking up words to see what am I reading. So it's better to go with some other trans. And look, reading other translations will help you. You show me someone that reads multiple translations, and I'll show you someone that knows more about the scriptures than the King James reader, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that they're not Christians or anything like that. I'm just saying their background, their understanding will be deeper and broader. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. Because we're supposed to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It tells us we don't know it all. If you're in the process of growing and learning something, you don't know it all yet. No one does. That's why we meet occasionally, here weekly, of course, with this group, to try to increase our knowledge of God. You know, someday the, the, the knowledge will be over the whole earth, as the waters you know, are covering, like the seas cover the earth right now. I think, what, three quarters of the earth is covered in water. Just imagine if we had that much knowledge of the scriptures out there, what we would have. Unfortunately, it's kind of like a little pond over here somewhere, <laughs> you know, the understanding. Second Timothy, let's go to Second Timothy 4.1. Did you notice what's going to happen? Kingdom, judging. So we know the kingdom appears when Christ appears. We know that the judgment will take place. We know now that the judgment of God is upon the household of God, but there's still a future judgment. You know, our sins can be forgiven. How we use the scriptures, or how we try to help other people, how we live, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. That's still a future event in that sense. And then we have other resurrections which we will go into. We don't have time today. But all this enters into this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. So here we see the change. In Corinthians 15, it talks about the twinkling of an eye or the, the blink of an eye. We will be changed. Those people that are still living will be changed. You know, not all shall die, Paul said. Not everybody's going to be living Christians on the earth when Christ returns. But it's going to be probably more dead Christians in the earth, waiting in the dust of the ground, waiting to be resurrected. His appearing for the resurrection of us and the appearance of the kingdom. And of course, that goes back to this corruptible must put in on incorruption, this perishable must put on. Christ comes to us. We don't go to heaven. So he comes here. We don't go there. And the traditional Christianity has it right reversed. And we all believe that, at least I did, and probably most of you did in your lifetime. So we're not throwing rocks, as they say, because we've, we've been there. <laughs> there are many, of course, many other scriptures that compare death to sleep and vice versa. The dead, of course, are not aware of the passing of time right now. They're just like in a deep sleep. This will be your time to catch up on your sleep. People talk, I could just get some more rest. Well, you're going to have the opportunity. <laughs> I don't know how long. But anyway, from the time you go into the grave, the time your eye opens, it's going to be like a twinkling of eye because you don't know what's going on. Our ancestors don't, are not looking down from heaven and say, oh, he is so wrong. I just wanted to share that with you today because this is a real life story. It just shows me too, the teaching that needs to be done. I mean, at the basic level, I'm not a scholar. I don't ever plan to be one. The Bibles were written for common people, fishermen. You know, people that work with their hands, carpenters, tent makers. Who was the great tent maker in the Bible? Apostle Paul. So it was made for people to understand and to be able to shed this good news, this gospel of the resurrection of the dead. When you get the opportunity and God opens the door for you, walk through it. <laughs>